This video is about Vibrio cholera. There are 119 Vibrio species, but there are particularly three that are important human pathogens. Cholera, which we're gonna talk about here, but also V. parahemolyticus and V. vulnificus. We're not gonna talk about them as much as cholera is kind of one of the more important pathogens. Um, it's the causative agent of the disease you may have heard of known as cholera. There have been seven major pandemics of cholera in human history, resulting in thousands of deaths and major socioeconomic changes. Um, some notable people who have been affected by cholera is uh, our 11th president, James K. Polk. He died of cholera during one such epidemic in 1849. King Charles X of France died of cholera in 1836. And it is proposed that Tchaikovsky, the brilliant composer, died of cholera. Um, however, some historians believe that he committed suicide after his mother died of cholera. But either way, cholera killed Tchaikovsky. Um, you can see here, I've got a, a public health notice that was actually posted in 1832 in New York when they didn't even know what caused cholera, but were trying to encourage good hygiene because they'd figured out that that played a pretty important role. And I'm always pretty amazed um, with microbiology historically about what they were able to figure out with so little. You know, cholera wasn't identified yet as the causative organism until 1854, over 20 years later, when Jon Snow, for all of you uh, Game of Thrones fans out there, this one was actually a microbiologist, not a member of um, the Night Watch, but um, they showed that it actually came from contaminated drinking water. Um, so what about cholera still makes it relevant today? Well, we don't really see much of it in the US, but it is still a very relevant pathogen. Um, if anyone remembers the earthquake that hit Haiti in 2010, they're still recovering for, from it. 10 months after the earthquake, health officials identified an increase in patients with watery di diarrhea and dehydration, and it was cholera. And what they found was that over the next year, there would be almost 500,000 cases of cholera and almost 7,000 people will die. Um, it's something that we do still worry about in areas that have been hit by some sort of um, significant natural disaster or have limited access to clean water. So think of this scenario. Cholera is mainly transmitted through a fecal oral route. So if you're thinking of developing countries, and right now I want you to think of Haiti after the earthquake, there aren't toilets that are running in some of these areas. There's no running water, that's probably not an option. So someone maybe with a self-limiting case of cholera uses the river, uses the restroom upriver, say over here, and it starts floating down, okay? Well, middle of the night, this little one, wakes up and needs to use the bathroom. Well, where do you think they're going? They're not going far, it's the middle of the night. So they come outside and they use the bathroom. There's nowhere to wash their hands. Uh, but even if there was, it's gonna float downstream. And the next morning, these boys go further downstream to collect water for their families to drink. Well. Let's say they can't get a fire growing, or even if they get a fire going, they don't have something suitable to boil the, the water and decontaminate it. Well, that kind of leads us to a different form of downstream here, where we have patients who are needing to treatment and treatment for cholera is largely rehydration. So this is an entire water-based pathway. So now a little bit about cholera, Vibrio cholera, the organism. Vibrio cholera grow well on a variety of simple media and they're really hardy organisms. They can grow at a wide range of temperatures, anything from 14 to 40 degrees Celsius. And this is important because typically it multiplies really well in free water. And this wide temperature range is not a problem. So you think 40 degrees, okay, well that makes me think of 
you know, tropical climates, warm climates, I think of bacterial growth there. But 14 degrees, that's downright chilly. And you might think, oh, well, it'll freeze, and when it thaws, it'll burst the bacteria. Not cholera. Cholera has no trouble with this temperature. They do have one requirement, which is kind of strange, and that is salt. They require salt. Um, they're halophilic and oxidase positive. Um, beyond that, they can also tolerate a really wide range of pHs, but they are generally susceptible to stomach acids. So um, stomach acids used for, gen for degradation can be pretty helpful in protecting us. But what does that mean? I mean, we know people still get sick with cholera. So how does that happen if they're susceptible to stomach acids? Well, it means one of two things. One, you need a really large inoculum of organisms for disease. So you have to have enough organisms that are going to make it past the stomach acids. You also could potentially have a situation where the stomach acids are neutralized. For example, patients taking on parazol, um, something that might reduce the stomach acids due to gastric ulcers or something. Um, the reservoir for these guys is estuary and marine waters where there you have heavy access to salt. They can also be found in fish that um, can be found in those areas. All strange strains of cholera have LPS consisting of endotoxic lipid A and O polysaccharide side chains. And these O side chains are really important. Um, the O side chains have actually been used to identify them serologically. Um, there have been over 200 serogroups, and these O groups help us determine which ones we know produce cholera toxin and have been associated with epidemics of cholera. Specifically, O1 and O139 are your biggest culprits for um, significant epidemics. Cholera also has a polar flagella that's important for its motility and a toxin co-regulated pillus, which basically allows it to adhere to the intestinal epithelium. It's non-invasive and really only causes damage to the lumen of the intestine, but these pili are kind of a virulence factor because they allow it to adhere. The toxin is how the disease is mediated. And in this case, it is what we call a typical AB subunit toxin. So what does that actually mean? An AB toxin is where you have two subunits that have to work together to create the toxin. The A subunit is the active subunit. This is what actually causes the mechanistic disease. So in this case, causes the diarrhea that we associate with cholera. The B subunit has no pathogenic activity. It just binds. However, A needs B, because A can't get into the epithelial cells of our intestinal lumen or wherever this, back, this toxin needs to go to do it its effect without B. And B has no pathogenic mechanism. So they need each other. A doesn't work without B, and B doesn't work without A. In the context of cholera toxin, there are really two subunits. CTXA and CTXB, and they've kept it simple. CTXA is the active subunit and CTXB is the binding subunit. There's a whole bunch of details that you can go over in the text or in your notes, but basically this is what you need to know. B binds to the epithelial cells of the intestines. A is then internalized and it uses the GS protein system to activate adenylate cyclase leading to increases in cyclic AMP. Anytime you see activation of adenylate cyclase leading to an increase in cyclic AMP. I want you to think of two words and they're really appetizing fun words. Watery, diarrhea. Anytime you increase cyclic AMP, you are increasing diarrhea. Watery, profuse diarrhea. Did I say that enough? Watery, profuse diarrhea? Because I mean water. I mean a lot of water. And one of the reasons I want to drive that home to you is that the buzzword for cholera is rice water, rice water diarrhea. Now think back to the last time you had food poisoning. You were sick for hours, maybe a day. Now imagine that went on with so much frequency and long enough that it became colorless, odorless, and free, just like water. That's what happens in cholera. 
So as you get more fluid lost, you get feces streaked with stool that are colorless, odorless, free of protein, and speckled with mucus. And that's what gives it this kind of white appearance, which makes it look like rice floating in water. I know this is a really, really attractive visual, and you're all just so excited to go eat dinner now after listening to this video. The majority of individuals, this is the good news, the majority of individuals who contract Vibrio cholera will be either asymptomatic or have a self-limited diarrheal gastroenteritis. However, some patients will develop a severe and possibly rapidly fatal enteritis if it's not treated. Disease typically manifests two to three days after ingestion of the contaminated water, but it can occur as quickly as 12 hours, depending on the inoculum and the state of the pH level within the gastrointestinal tract of the patient. There is an abrupt onset of the watery diarrhea and vomiting. Fever is rare and might be indicative of a secondary infection, and the severe fluid electrolyte, electrolyte loss leads to dehydration, and dehydration is actually the most important component of this disease. So when we think of dehydration, think of really severe dehydration and what's going to happen. Well, anytime you're dehydrated, you're losing electrolytes, you're gonna have painful muscle cramps, metabolic acidosis, hypokalemia and hypovolemic shock due to the potassium loss, and that can lead to cardiac arrhythmia and renal failure. So in this case, it's not the organism that's killing you. It's dehydration caused by the cholera toxin. If patients aren't treated and the treatment is just to replace the lost fluid and electrolytes, but if you don't do that, mortality can be as high as 70%. But as long as fluid is replaced fairly quickly, it's less than 1%. There are some sources that say you can treat with azithromycin to um, replace, um, to, to shorten the course. But really, replacement of fluid is the standard of care. Um, it's somewhat controversial. Most sources say not to even worry about the azithromycin and just stick with replacing the fluids because as long as we can keep the body functional, you'll probably fight it off. You just need to keep the body functional and you need fluid to do that. Um, early disease is detectable by direct microscopic examination of stool specimens. You'll be able to see the actual organism in the stool and that can provide a rapid presumptive diagnosis during cholera outbreaks. Um, but in endemic areas, so um, developing countries with poor clean water resources, there are immunoassays for detection of cholera toxin, particularly those O1 and O139 strains that we know can um, really be problematic. So if you detect those, you're going to want to be kind of on high alert and be ready to replace fluids quickly. Um, it does grow readily, and you can even use some selective augers to grow it out faster, like thiosulfite citrate with bile salts and sucrose or an alkaline peptone um, broth. Prevention is both easy and impossible. It's good hygiene and clean water. You either have it or you don't.